If you haven't got the time to be scrolling through right move, building relationships with estate agents, you know, going direct to vendor, looking for properties all the time, a property sourcer can really come in handy. Hey, welcome to another episode of Fire Podcast, where we share stories of female property investors of today to inspire investors of tomorrow. My name is Cynthia and I am your host. So today we are joined by Emily, an inspiring property investor. She started her property um, sourcing business last year in 2022 and also has multiple buy to let properties. Today she will be sharing her story, her journey, what led her to you know transition from her job where she was working out to becoming a property investor and being her own boss and all the nitty gritties of being a modern day fire. So let's welcome Emily. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the Fire Podcast. How are you? Hi, Cynthia. Thank you so much. I'm good. I'm great. Thank you. Yeah. How about you? I'm good. Thank you. And welcome to 2024. How was your Christmas and New Year's? Hope you had an amazing celebration. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, a great end of the year and looking forward to a new year ahead. I can't believe it. So it's come around. Of course, of course, same here, same here. So, Emily, um, today we just want to hear your story because I know you're a female real estate investor, you're a FIRE, right? Yeah. So you're on the right platform, FIRE, which is obviously a podcast to celebrate female property investors. So mm -hmm. today we want to talk about your journey, your experiences, like, you know, share some of your tips and advice and, you know, like basically just tell us who is Emily and what do you do? Yeah, well, it's quite a big question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, my name's Emily. And uh, the main kind of thing that I do is I'm a, a property sourcer. So um, I have a hands-free property sourcing company called Properties for Potteries, which is based in Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent. So Stoke-on-Trent's often referred to as the Potteries, hence the name Properties for Potteries, which was a nice handy little alliteration there. Um, and yeah, this is a company that I've launched in April 23. So still, you know, fairly new and um, still in the first year of, of going. Um, and yeah, basically it's a hands-free service for people who want to get into investment, but perhaps don't know how, don't have the time to do it themselves, busy, full-time working, you know, people who, who know that they want to get their money working for them and get into property investment, but don't really, you know, want to do it themselves. So I'll kind of guide them through the full end-to-end -end process from um, finding the perfect property that matches their criteria, connecting them with the conveyancing and guiding, the, guiding them through the purchase. We also have uh, managed refurbs that we offer as well with a full in-house refurb team um, and then you know completing the investment, however that might look for them, whether that's connecting them with a letting agent if they're holding the property or uh, refinancing, selling on, you know, whatever it, it might look like for them. So that's the kind of primary thing that that I do, um, but I, you know, I'm also an investor myself. So, myself and my husband, we um, we invest in buy to let properties in Stoke on Trent and Staffordshire. Again, you're probably sensing a bit of a theme. Big fan of Stoke on Trent, <laughs> um, and yeah, we we've kind of started building our portfolio, which we initially got into because my other half, he is a joiner, he's self employed, and he has been, you know, since he left school. And we kind of both always knew that we wanted something that was going to act as a bit of a pension part and a long term kind of plan because, you know, he's never had that that security of, of that, you know, full time job. And obviously now that I've gone into my own business, I'm in the same position as well. So we, we both really you know understand the value of, of property as an asset. Um, and then investing in that way. And yeah, it's just something we've kind of built up over over time, really. And very much still investing, you know, as we're going along and looking forward to, to building up the portfolio. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, so, so for people that don't know, can you just give us like a quick explanation of what um, a property sourcer is? Like, what is that? And what do you do in terms of, like, I know you've kind of talked a little bit, but just give like a, a brief description of what it is. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it is quite an alien concept to a lot of people. I think a lot of people don't really know, don't really know what it is. Um, but yeah, it's basically it's very a cheesy term, but I like to kind of tell people that I'm like a personal property shopper. 
So it's like, you know, I'll, if you haven't got the time to be scrolling through right move, building relationships with estate agents, you know, going direct to vendor, looking for properties all the time, a property sourcer can really come in handy to understand the criteria that you're looking for and understand, you know, exactly what investment goals you have and then matching you up with a property that matches that criteria. Um, and you know, as sources, we have great networks, we have great connections with estate agents and you know, again, direct to vendor and other people who, who we might be able to secure you deals and negotiate deals that you might not be able to get through the sort of traditional routes as well. Um, so yeah, it's very much kind of helping you find that property and taking the pressure off of you searching for it yourself. And then, you know, also sources like myself who have that kind of hands-free element we will like guide you through the, the full process as well and um, so you know when if you come on board with me then you don't have to be speaking to you estate agents solicitors brokers you know all these different people I'll kind of be that that communication point for you I'll be that main point of contact so all emails and things kind of go through me you just tell me everything what you want um, and I'll just kind of manage all that communication for you, obviously keeping you fully informed throughout and you have final approval and everything. Um, but yeah, it's very much just kind of taking taking that hassle away from you yourself. Perfect. That sounds great. Okay, so Emily, what were you doing before you started property investing, like so becoming a deal sourcer and also mm -hmm. getting your bite to We'll talk about your bite to in a minute, but what exactly were you doing just before you started this whole journey? What's your background yeah. In? yeah, it is actually quite a different background to property. Um, so yeah, I mean, when, you know, all my sort of education journey, school, college, uni and all that kind of stuff followed a fairly traditional path. And um, I did, you know, I was okay academically. I just kind of followed similar routes to what my friends were doing. I went on from, from GCSEs to do A-levels. Then I went to uni to study. Um, I did a degree in music technology with management, which is not property related at all. And something that I really enjoyed, you know, it was a hobby and uh, I'm glad I did. But I think a lot of people have similar stories in that they follow this path to uni, study this degree, and then they come out of uni and they're like, well, what now? You know, it's, it's a, quite a hard field to get into. Um, so I actually ended up going into a digital marketing role, which was specifically for paid social advertising. Um, so I was very lucky. I went straight into um, a, an entry level role at a really great digital marketing agency um, who taught me so much. It was a great role. You know, I stayed there for just, just over six years and kind of built my way up um, in the paid social department from just sort of entry level um, Excel reporting and, and whatnot to, to be an account director at the end of, of my time there. As much as I enjoyed it, you know, as long as I kind of went on in that sort of corporate busy environment um, and onto some very sort of stress, stressful clients um, and stressful, busy, you know, workload. I just kind of, it became more and more apparent that I, I wasn't looking to stay in that long term, you know, and, and knew that as if I was going to progress further up in the ranks at in that industry, it was just going to get more and more stressful. And I was just going to be, you know, earning more money, but not having the time to spend it and, you know, not having the mental capacity to enjoy the fruits of your labor kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I just went for it, really. It was quite a bold, <laughs> bold move, basically just. Uh, left left the previous job and went full time into into the deal sourcing, which was scary at the time. Um, but it was it was needed, and I'm so glad I did it now. Yeah, I mean that is that's the thing, isn't it? Because sometimes I feel like a lot of people find it hard to leave their jobs, especially when it's a good mm -hmm. paying job and a job that you actually kind of enjoy. But yeah. doesn't necessarily, like you said, give you the freedom to you know spend time with your loved ones or like you know like the mental capacity that you need to just like really enjoy your life a lot of people struggle to leave those kind of jobs to start their own businesses um just because you know you just never know what if you start a business and it doesn't work you know yeah. what if you get into something and you quit this good earning job um, or good paying job to start something and it's not as um, and the thing that you started isn't even covering your bills so how did you how do you find the strength or what sort of mindset would you say that you were at where you where you when you decided to say okay do you know what I'm not I don't want to do this job anymore I want to focus on you know creating my own business I want to do my own thing you know mm -hmm. to be able to help me to get to where I need to be what sort of mindset did you adopt and how exactly did you make that transition yeah it definitely didn't happen overnight it took I mean I'm someone that likes to think through things quite a lot anyway and 
I don't really make snap decisions as a person. I, you know, I, I like to kind of think things oh, through. So it definitely because I'm so spontaneous. <laughs> I'm such yeah, a spontaneous I mean... person. I can wake up today and this idea I'm not going to work anymore. That's it. I quit, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah sometimes it's good though isn't it like you need to be able to just to just do things but yeah it was really just you know I, I knew that I'd, like I say I knew I'd got to the point where I wanted to leave that role and as I say it was a great company that I worked for it was a great agency and I, I knew that if I was to move to another agency or role in the same industry I would it wouldn't be as good or I'd probably end up you know in the same position again in a couple of years so I knew I didn't want to move in the same industry and I just thought, you know, I, I did do some intensive education as well. So I made sure that I had the knowledge, you know, I, I did some kind of evening courses and went through quite a lot of extensive education while I was working my notice period at my old job. And that was a very kind of intense period as well. So, you know, I wanted to make sure I had that knowledge and that education. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm very lucky to have a great support in my husband as well, you know, very lucky in that we have a couple of, of investment properties already and he is you know regularly in and stuff so he is able to support you know support as while I was kind of getting the business up and running um but in terms of the mindset it was it was really just kind of now or never like just go for it um and it was like well you know what if it doesn't work out then at least I tried at least I gave it a good go I can always come back to the marketing and you know that that'll always be there but um yeah it's I think at some point you have to just jump off the deep end don't you um and it was like a, you know I was at the point before where I was just really ready to take that step so yeah it's kind of hard to give a, a proper answer really because yeah, I know that makes sense no because like from what you said like you, you said that one of the first things that you did was to get the knowledge that you needed right? like, yeah get the education and which is which is what I think to everyone if you want to change your life if you want to you know, leave your job and go to something else. If you want to do something that's different to what you've ever done, you want to have a complete um career or you know, like like a whole a complete career change. The first step is to actually learning about the thing that you want to get into, right? Like yeah. you know, like if you if you um if you've never done it before, find someone who has learned from them. Go and pay for a course, pay for yeah. a degree, whatever it is you have to pay for to get to where you need to get to like when I started my property business as well I had to go and invest and pay for someone to teach me about property investing and um, I feel like that's just that once you once you've decided in your head it's now or never right once you've had that mindset shift I feel like the next step is to go and educate yourself in the yeah. field that you're trying to get into definitely yeah yeah because you know obviously there's there's some stuff that you can learn it's two there's two elements isn't there there's stuff that you can learn on the job and you won't have that experience and that real world experience until you jump in but then there are obviously important things to make sure you know before you start as well the basics and you know with deal sourcing as well you need certain things to be compliant you need to be insured you need to understand you know the the crux of it all so yeah it's um getting educated is really important that's right so tell us about a little bit about your property journey um mm -hmm. so far so you've been doing it for over a year right so tell us how has yep. this year been is it has it been worth the you know work you leave in your 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 career your the things that you're used to and starting this just tell us a little bit about your journey how like you know how it's been going for the past one year yeah yeah i mean it's been kind of twofold obviously we, we our own investments has been Yes, and sort of just before COVID, we started um, taking it, you know, really seriously and, and, and understanding that we were going to start building this portfolio. So, um, yeah, it actually all began when we when we bought our first residential house, which is in 2018. Um, so the first house that, that me and my husband lived in, um, we bought it and it was it needed a lot of work. It was really run down, you know, very, um, hadn't been touched in years. And it, yeah, we did basically a lot of work to it. Um, we reconfigured a lot of the space. We knocked through into a garage to make a big kitchen. We filled in, there was like a really creepy old mechanics pit in the floor, which we filled in because that really gave me the creeps. You know, we basically overhauled it um, and that allowed us to then refinance the property a couple of years down the line and pull out the funds, which we then used for our first buy to let deposits. So that's how we actually started off the kind of the journey. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, we it's been going really well with our, with our own investments. You know, we've we've kind of stuck to pretty straightforward buy to let strategies. Um, I know a lot of people are reluctant to kind of go down that route now with with how interest rates have risen. Um, for us, we're kind of in it for the long term. As I mentioned, we're looking for you know a long term retirement plans and uh, holding the assets, letting letting them build in value over time, refinancing them as we go along, but. They're not super cash flow focused for us, so it works for us. Um, you know, obviously there are options where you could be going down higher cash flow routes, HMOs, um, those kinds of things. For me, I feel like there's a lot of hidden kind of costs and fees associated with those that people don't always take into account. For us, I think we're you know we're quite focused on just uh, vanilla buy to lets as they like to call them for now. Um, but you know, later down the line, I think we might definitely diversify our our portfolio. So first you said, um, you know, like you guys bought your first um, home, your first residential home in 2018, you did some work and you were able to refinance that later on um, and pull out some cash. Just kind of because some of our, our, our um, you know, some of our listeners may not know what refinance is. Can you just sort of talk us through a little bit about that and how much money exactly, if you're, if you're okay to share that? Because we like to talk numbers on on the yeah. podcast, how much how much did you buy that house how much money did you spend in doing it up and how mm-hmm. much were you able to pull out from it after how many years or just kind of tell us a little bit about that experience yeah of course yeah well we we bought the property it was in Stoke-on-Trent um, and we bought the property in 2018 we actually it went through on Black Friday so it was the best Black Friday deal we've ever had <laughs> um, and yeah we got it for it basically 170 it was like 169 50 or something and um, so it was just just under 170 and yeah as I say it, it needed a, a lot of work it's it's in a good location it's a, a popular residential location um it's three bed uh, detached house so you know it's um that we that's what we really kind of it drew us to it you know the potential of the property we knew that it was there to add value um it used to be like a mechanics house and so there was a garage down the side of the of the house which spanned the whole length of, of the house but was just you know wasted space in terms of what we we thought because we're not mechanics um so we decided to kind of knock through and make that part of the of the area and then we were able to make a real nice feature kind of kitchen we added in downstairs toilet uh utility so you know these are all elements that really add a lot of value to to a house you know a, a kitchen adding more utilities the more space reconfiguring things um, and everything else was you know kind of completely cosmetically overhauled as well um so yeah and we bought it at that and then obviously the process of refinancing is you know when you've added value to a property by a refurb m- mostly you kind of force it up via by a refurb but it does increase generally over time anyway but adding adding a re- adding work buyer or refer will help it move quicker and help you be able to write refinance quickly um and then basically what you can do is you get it valued at the updated value that you've now um brought it up to so we we managed to get ours up to about 220 um from 170 so we did add we'd added up quite you know quite a bit there um and you basically refinance the the lending on it so and you're able to kind of pull out the the increase in, in funds that you've that you've made there and you know there are things to consider so your monthly payments change a bit you know because you're mortgaging at a higher value you are paying more a month and um, this was before the interest rates went up so steeply so we didn't so we didn't uh, have the impact of that as much as we would today that's a big thing for people to consider now um but yeah that's that's what we did basically yeah and, and pulled out that that money um which is i think a lot of people i certainly did before i knew about it i always thought refinancing was something you did when you're in like a really bad situation you know like it's not a good thing to do at all refinancing a mortgage sounded really scary but it's like flicking that that mindset which is not easily done it's not something we're brought up with but it's about that perception of leveraging your assets and you know yeah doing it that way rather than um you know having the cash in the bank in, in your case like i mean obviously you spent the money wisely because you've gone and reinvested it in, in yeah like buying another property so you've gone and purchased another asset with it right however if you were just refinancing your property to buy like i don't know a sports car or you know go on some luxury vacation then that is when it would be like you know an unwise thing to do that yeah makes sense but like the fact that you're pulling out that money to reinvest it into something that's also going to be bringing you money and it's also an asset to you then yeah. obviously it's definitely a very um 
wise decision to make. So yeah, congratulations on that, by the way, because it's obviously it's not easy, like yeah. in this <laughs> day and age, to even buy a house, talk more of like refinancing, do the work, and even like you know buy another house, like a buy to let. So let's talk a little mm-hmm. bit about your buy to let, um, mm-hmm. you know, experience. So you purchased that first buy to let. And um, how, what was the state of the house? What are you doing with that house right now? Yeah, yeah. So the first one that we got um, definitely needed some some work doing to it. So it was a very kind of typical investment property in in Stoke-on-Trent, two up, two down terrace um, in a really nice area, sort of ST4 postcode near to the hospital, near to, um, you know, a couple of different town centres. And and it's like, again, it's quite a popular investment um, location and street that that we went for and it's also got a good kind of reputation for capital growth as well you know the properties do kind of um kind of go up well there and yeah it was it was a refurb job so we put you know a full new kitchen in there new bathroom suite and new flooring throughout there was some damp treatment to be done as well and which we actually initially used to be able to negotiate a lower price on so um, you know, again, damp is, is a big topic for people and can sometimes put a lot of investors off. Um, if they hear about damp problems in a property, it's like, don't touch it with a barge pole, but it actually worked to our favor in this one because we were able to negotiate a lower price on the property. Um, and then because we have the team and the expertise, you know, we could treat the damp at, at a reasonable cost and make sure it was all sorted and fixed as it needed to be um, as part of the refurb. So um, yeah, that that was included in the work as well. And just, yeah, plastering, painting, new flooring, um, just basically a full cosmetic overhaul. Um, yeah, some rewiring as well. There was quite a lot of electrical work to be done um, in, in the property as well. So yeah, really just kind of going in, giving everywhere a facelift, making it safe, making it a nice um, home for somebody and um, pretty neutral, you know, color schemes and things. And that's what we kind of tend to do with buy to lets in general. We like to just have a bit of a blank canvas, which is just clean and comfortable so that tenants can then come in and put their own stamp on it. And um, it's easy to maintain for us going forward. If we need to replace anything or repair it, we don't have to go and source some crazy bespoke wallpaper or carpet or something. It's, you know, it's all pretty sort of standard and straightforward. So um, yeah, that was the work that we did on the property. And then, and we were able to to get it done really quickly. So we actually got the refurb, com- we sort of completed on the property um, like early December. Well, so I think it was like end of November. And then the refurb was completed in December and then we had it let immediately after Christmas. So it, it all moved very, very quickly. Um, and obviously again, that's testament to my husband and, and the team and, and the refurb team that, that did the work there. Um, you know yeah. it's such a the blessing back. when you're when you're a property investor it's such a blessing such a joy to have someone who is who works in property somehow like in your case your husband's a joy that you know how much money you can <laughs> say you, you yeah. save or just you know in doing most of the joinery work in any property that you have because like I don't know how much we have to pay joiners like yeah to do the work in our house like, imagine if you could just save on that cost that is actually amazing so, um, so that so well done on that. Congrats again on purchasing your first um, buy to let. So, tell me, how many buy to lets have you um, have you currently got now? Yeah, so we've got two. We've got two at the moment, okay. um, and we've got plans to buy our third one early next year. That's that's in the pipe. Sorry, early this year. <laughs> that's in the pipeline <laughs> for um twenty twenty four. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, okay. No, I was just kidding. when we were doing the work on the first buy to window and we saw the for sale sign across directly across the road on the other one and then that ended up being the second one that we bought. Um oh, so they're really? literally right across the road from each other. It's it's funny oh, when things work out. <laughs> that's good. That's interesting. Okay, cool. So congrats on all of that. That's big, big Thank achievement. You. So what I wanted us to discuss is um, you know, like in terms of I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier on in terms of like you know, the interest rates now, you know, not being too favorable for buy to let property investors and especially if you're renting the traditional way. I'm guessing that your properties are currently rented just the traditional way, like to a family or a couple mm-hmm. of friends or something, yeah? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. So so how, how do you plan? I know you're planning to buy more properties this year. How mm-hmm. do you plan to navigate that, like in terms of like the, the, the interest rate issue? Because it's such a big, deal for a lot of people even for me personally i'm currently trying not to put anything on a mortgage um, the the buy to lets that i've got right now 
and have just been bought cash just because I cannot deal with the interest <laughs> rates issue like all of I can't right now but and also I I'm also using more like you know high cash flowing strategies like HMO and Airbnb but for people who are interested in like just a single let and want to rent it to a nice family how mm. are you going to try and navigate or how just tell us what you're going to do to to not be so heavily affected by the interest rates I completely appreciate that the interest rates are, you know, worrying for people. Um, you know, people do expect some some cash flow from their buy to let properties, so it has had a big impact on people. Um, but you know, I think it's it's about remembering the long game with property, right? And always remembering um how the value of property is going to increase over time. And um, so, as I say, I kind of really approach my buy to lets as a long term investment. I know that later down the line, the value of that property is going to go up, and I am going to get that money out long term even if it's not kind of coming out monthly right now um also you know there are lots of signs of those interest rates coming down you know inflation has been coming down which is a great sign they've been holding the base rate for quite a few months now and it's kind of predicted to come down um early 2024 as well so there are signs of seeing improvement there um but yeah if you are looking at things like cash flow i think a really great option could be sort of connecting with things like social housing providers those kinds of things um they offer you the the option to kind of really lock in long term fixed leases and take care of things like maintenance for you um so you don't have to pay for things like um you know tenant finding and um, you don't have to pay for ongoing maintenance and that can sa- that can save a lot of costs for you on a monthly basis which can be eaten into your cash flow um and it's also a lot more hands free for people as well and it's you know it's an amazing thing to be doing as well right helping out these these vulnerable people who need who need homes right now more than ever so that you know there are options for you to kind of increase your cash flow as well and as you mentioned there are things like hmo service accommodation you know those those strategies are absolutely viable and um, if if you fully understand all the kinds of fees associated with it as well you know i think just a lot of people are kind of pivoting to hmos and things just with the thought of, well, I've got more tenants in there, I'm gonna have more people paying rent, the cash flow is gonna be better, right? But then when you start breaking it down to them, you know, you're gonna have to be paying much higher fees on your mortgage, their interest rates work much differently, the end value of a HMO can vary, you know, you're looking at bricks and mortar versus your commercial valuation, and um, you know, your refurbs are that much more complicated and it, it really does all kind of start to build up at, so that when you zoom out and look at the bigger picture you kind of might have actually been better just sticking on quite a simple easy buy to let in the long run so it's it's all just about understanding that general picture if in doubt zoom out which i actually really like because i think that really speaks to having that perspective in property and and kind of thinking about that long-term game so um it's not an overnight thing you know very few strategies in in property are going to be overnight in terms of cash flow even deal sourcing you know it takes a while to establish it and get and get it off the ground but um it will kind of pay you off in, in the long term so let's bring you back to sort of deal sourcing so how how did you start and like how much would you say you you it cost you to get started yeah so there, there is some sort of cost um you know associated with with it you have to get compliant you know so you have to be insured you have to be a member of um like a regular regulatory body like property ombudsman or, or redress scheme you know so, something like that and um, you have to have data protection insurance you know all these kinds of things um and there are sort of ongoing costs as well even just hosting your um website domains memberships to things like DocuSign and you know um, you even have to pay for I think it's, it's, all like, it's all like you know little costs it's not like that yeah or like you know or you're you've been yeah. able to start a to deal sourcing business um we just you know not it's not it doesn't sound like I mean it's just all little you know payments and subscriptions here and there but it doesn't mm-hmm. sound like you know back breaking you know um amounts of money right yeah, no, I think that is the beauty of of deal sourcing and deal packaging. Really, it's the business model is you know once you start bringing some clients in and, and getting some income from those fees, you do very quickly make a profit. And um, so it's not like other businesses. You know, if you're looking to start a business and you might have to outlay a lot in terms of stock or uh, machinery or you know whatever it might be um deals deal sourcing isn't really like that so it is it is a good model for for in terms of that 
Um, but you know, probably the most, the, as you said before, the most important investment that you're going to make at the start of that journey is really into the education. And um, so that was the highest cost I paid out. Really, you went for a training program on how to become a deal source, and that was how you started. Yeah, it kind of covered all all aspects of property trading. A really great kind of comprehensive overview of um, all the different strategies. Um, how breaking down a deal, you know, refurb, everything really uh, that you kind of need to know um, and, and the important points sort of getting compliant and, and things like that as well. So yeah, that's how I kind of, I knew that I wanted to go into deal sourcing because I already decided that my skills lent itself well to it. I knew I'm, you know, quite an organized person. I love a process. I love a system. Um, I like, you know, managing different parts and pulling, pulling different things together. And I'm really, you know, passionate about property and obviously, my knowledge of the area, the deals, the the property market in Stoke on Trent, um, but yeah, obviously I knew I needed to you know do some some formal education to get to get into the nitty gritty of, of the things that I obviously didn't know, and I'm still learning now. You know, and um, obviously this first year it's been it's been a big learning curve. Obviously you can only learn so much in theory, but once you start actually doing it in practice, mixing with all these people you know, getting into all these networking groups and mixing with these property communities who have been doing it for years and all sorts of different strategies and wild and wonderful approaches. And that's invaluable as well, you know, learning from people as you go along and as you speak to them. It sounds great. So in terms of like property deal sourcing, right? We, we, we like, I want, I want our listeners, our people listening to this um, to understand how much exactly is it that you can make from a deal sources. So how much of average would you say you you um, charge or you make off of one deal? And what type of deals do you do you source at a day? I'm guessing you know market value property? So not always. Um, it definitely can be, you know, sometimes. But um, as I mentioned, it's kind of all, it's very much tailored to the client's criteria. Um, it's really dependent on what works for them and what's going to meet their goals. So, you know, things like below market value and off market properties, these are a lot of like buzzwords that are thrown around from a lot of sources. You know, we we only give you this, we, you know, we can get, we can guarantee you below market value, we can guarantee you off market. And that's great like that, you know, those, those things can be really great. But you can still find great deals on market and just negotiating, you know, you know, obviously you would always negotiate, but, you know, it doesn't have to be some crazy below market value for it to still be a good deal. Of course. So how much would you say you, you make on average per deal and how frequent are these deals? Because I know that's a lot of the skepticism some people have in terms of going into property deal sourcing. It's like the deals are not always consistent. You might be able to get a deal today and you won't get out of any any other deal in like three or six months time and stuff like that. So how do you, you know, navigate that? And before we get to how you navigate that, how how often do you get deals and um how much do you make up of these deals on average? Yeah, well, I mean, the deals are out there all the time, I find, especially in Stoke-on-Trent and in, in Staffordshire. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I chose to specialise in this area. You know, there's always new properties coming out on the market. The rental demand is huge at the moment, um, you know, and and this area really is is a great investment area. So I'm, I'm you know, I wouldn't say there's any trouble in, in finding deals. Um, I think for, for my side, it's, it's more... You know, I'll find the investors first, I'll find the clients first, onboard them and understand their criteria. And then we go out and find the deals that, you know, match up to them. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's any trouble with with kind of finding deals because there's always property out there and especially in this area. Um, and yeah, in terms of, of charging and things, so different sources do it differently. Some sort of charge a certain percentage of the property price or sort of things like that. For me, I have like a fixed fee and it's a, it's in a couple of different tiers. So it depends on whether you are including the full hands-free service, whether it's um, including sort of all the way from sourcing the property right through to the end um, of, the, of the investment, including a refurb in there as well, which is obviously a significant amount of added added work and organisation. Um, that's that's a fixed fee of five thousand pounds, and then um, for just sourcing the property and kind of guiding you through the process, but taking out the managed refurb. So perhaps it's a property that doesn't need refurb, or you're using your own team, or whatever it might be. And um, then it's a sourcing fee of about three of three thousand pounds. And so they're sort of you know pretty standard 
benchmarks in, in the industry, really. Um, and, you know, I, if there is something that needs to be more flexible or tailored to, to a certain client's demands, then we can do that. Um, but yeah, and then obviously, you know, you, you've got some costs outlaid as well. You, marketing is probably my biggest cost, um, uh, you know, getting my name out there, especially in this first year, it's all been about getting my name out there and in front of the right people. Um, and, you know, with my background in paid social, I'm leaning quite heavily on on that. So um, that's where yeah, a lot of my... I was, I was just about to say, okay. you've already got uh, the background in, in digital marketing. So that, that should kind of come easy for you then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah again it was it was another reason why I thought I could I could really make a success of this because I knew that that was another kind of transferable skill and um, but again I mean it's been a learning curve you know I didn't I never worked on any property clients and, and it's very strange doing it for yourself rather than clients as well and um, it's really weird like it took a long time to get used to <laughs> all right cool so so let's let me just get this right so you and or you make about three to five thousand pounds her deal that you source for your clients that's amazing well done and um in terms of like these deals like what would you say the frequency of those these deals are like monthly how many deals do you tend to source in a month yeah, so it's, you know, it, it's hard to give a concrete number. It really varies. And I found that it particularly varied this year with, you know, obviously getting going and starting, getting off the ground the first few months, it didn't really have any completed deals, go, you know, completed people going through. Um, and the interest rates, you know, and the way that the property market has changed and fluctuated this year, people have been more reluctant I've had a lot of like consultation processes and people come in and, and almost go in and then not quite getting over the line um, or thinking you know I'm going to hold off I'm going to wait um so it's hard it, how, it really how varies do you deal it's with not that disappointment though how do you deal with that yeah so it's, that can be a lot especially when you put in a lot of work into that deal and you know sourcing the deal find it for the, and then just sort of pull out last minute and all something yeah. changes and they can't go like how do you deal with that yeah, it's it has been a bit of a roller coaster this first year, you know, which I always knew it, it would be. Um it is tough, you know, when you've when you've put a lot of um of thought and effort into the consultations and into the into the offering and yeah, I mean it, it is tough. It's kind of up and down and that's the same in any business, right? In that first year, you know, I think for me as a person as well. I'm definitely somebody who loves like structure and organization and my previous job you know, I wasn't, I wasn't happy in it and I knew that, but it, I was very lucky in that it was structured. I had a regular, you know, work, regular income and, and all that kind of stuff. So it definitely was an adjustment going from that to this. And, you know, you want it so bad in that fit. I mean, you always want it, but in that first year when you, you know, you know that you want to make a success of it, you're really hungry for it to, to succeed. It is hard when, when things um, don't, don't come off but you got to just keep going really you just got to push through and, and try and think the learnings uh, remember what you've learned from everyone as well um you know just tweak things or, uh, you know I've made plenty of changes to how I do things and and the way that I structure things based off how those initial consultation calls went and those initial consultations fell through but well why was that you know did I give away too much did I not you know position myself in the right way okay well next time I'll change it I'll do this and yeah it's it's like a real steep learning curve and you learn a lot um but you just got to keep pushing through and pushing through and then you know once you start to establish that name for yourself and that reputation as long as you're authentic and and honest with people and you know you you're clear and transparent then i think people trust you people um like you and again that's really important right because you know this is big sums of money people are trusting with you that big plans people are trusting you with like their retirement plans or their inheritance or their kids you know pots of money and it's it's um it's a big responsibility so it takes a lot for people to build up that trust with you and um, it's not going to happen overnight in, in in deal sourcing which a lot of people sell sell that it will you know that you know you'll deal sourcing is like a, lot, a quick a way to a lot of things a lot of people said a lot of things on yeah <laughs> but i feel like everyone just needs to be aware or like you know like knowledgeable enough to know to be able to see out the truth from the lies and you know the things that we're being fed just so that people can make it sale and stuff like that do you understand so like I, it's, there's definitely so much information out there so many misleading information as well about almost everything and anything these days Okay, good. So what I wanted to find out again is if you could change one thing in your property journey, what would it be? 
Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I know it's a really cliche answer, but I don't know if I would change anything because although there has been um, down moments like that, you know, that have it hasn't been plain sailing the whole time. Obviously, it has. There has been some tough moments uh, where I have questioned if I made the right decision. I think um, you know, ultimately, every down moment has then taught me something, which then has helped me learn and grow and, and get to where I am now. So. Um, I don't think I would really change anything. I mean, if I could control the interest okay. rates, I would like to just <laughs> do that. <laughs> but I don't know if I could change that. That's great. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. So tell me, what would you say is your worst experience so far when it comes to, because I like to give people, you know, choose, I like to show people both sides of the coin, right? I like to show people the benefits or the good sides of the business or property investment. I also like to talk about the negatives as well just so that people are more informed to understand like they know exactly what they're getting themselves into if this is what they want to do for themselves, right? So tell us, you can tell us what one like really bad experience or your worst challenge has been since starting your property business. Yeah, yeah, that's another good question. Um, Yeah, to be fair, it's probably just been experiencing that, um, you know, that fluctuation, as I said, in that first year. I remember there was one week which was like sort of um, not that long ago, I don't know, maybe October time or something. It was kind of as we were getting into the latter half of the year, you know, I'd launched the business in April and I was thinking, you know, I really want to start to see some some income, some business from it, some success. And it kind of, you know, it was getting further and further. And I thought, you know, things were falling through, certain things had had come off and other things hadn't. And then there was one week where I had loads in the pipeline and it was really you know I had investors almost on board everything was looking really good and I thought this is it you know this is the the moment everyone talks about where it all comes together and it's all worth it and then like everything just fell through (laughs) I think the the investor was like no you know I changed my mind I don't want to come on board I can't remember the details now but you know it was just one of those weeks where it was like I really thought this was it I really thought um you know, this was the moment that everyone talks about. Um, so yeah, but you just have to bounce back, don't you? You just have to build that. that, bit of that is, that's the thing. That's the nature of any business, right? That's the nature of running your own business. You're going to have weeks and days yeah. like that, right? Or weeks yeah. months like that, or even years like that sometimes. <laughs> However, it's all about knowing the potential that your business has and what you have to offer as well. And just, Absolutely. you know, eyes on the prize and just keep it moving. Don't let that stop you, right? Yeah. So, 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 so share a, a, like a positive, you know, experience. What is it that you think about your business or your, your property journey so far that you're like, wow, I'm so happy. I'm so blessed that I did this. I'm so grateful that I was able to do this. Yeah. I think I just, I, there's loads of moments where I feel like that. I, you know, ultimately I'm just, I'm so grateful that I now have this freedom that I can manage my own time, that I can do something I'm really passionate about. And, um, you know, and I think like, it's really important to reflect, isn't it, on how far you've come and, and how things that just seem normal now, like a few years ago, if you just said to yourself, I- I'm gonna be doing this in a few years, you never would have believed yourself, you know? Yeah. If I spoke to myself a couple of years ago, I would have still been in that same, you know, that same role. Never would have even thought about launching my own business, never mind in property sourcing. Probably didn't even really know what a property sourcer was. Um, and there's all sorts of things like that where I think, you know, work related and even just life things. Like I always used to be so nervous of driving on the motorway. And then now I just, you know, I gradually did it, did it, did it. And now it's fine. Now it's, I do it all the time. And, and I know they seem like little insignificant things and, and that aren't related, but it's all just evidence of, you know things that you didn't think you were capable of and now you've smashed them so definitely like i can totally relate with them to what you've just said now like for me personally one one big thing or one big positive for me from starting my property business is just having the freedom like spend yeah. time with my loved ones my kids to do the things that i want to do to be able to just take a holiday whenever i want to not having to you know wait for anybody to 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 sign up on my holiday and yeah. all of that right and also, like you said, what you just said now about how, you know, it makes you realize that you're actually capable of doing more than you thought you were. I always thought I was terrible at DIY. I always <laughs> used to think, oh, please, never me. Just I'm never having, I'm never doing this. But then I've gone through experiences where I've been forced to DIY in some of my properties to be able to like, you know, not go crazily over budget. And I've, and, and when I look at the properties and the things that I've done in, like the DIY jobs that I've done in, in those properties, I'm like, wow, like 
this could actually really be a thing. Like I was ready to pay someone six, seven thousand pounds to build this for me. <laughs> and I ended up building it for even less than a fraction of that. Do you understand? Yeah. And so it's that is that's one thing when it comes to like starting your own business, not necessarily just in property. It makes you realize that you're actually capable of more than what you thought you were. And that for me also is one one benefit of, you know, just being out there and being your own boss, doing things your own way and trying to figure out solutions and find answers to the problems that you come across. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because there's no one else to hold you accountable. You have you have to exactly. do it for yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So um obviously our podcast is all about inspiring women and your story has been so inspiring like you know people who are out there in their jobs or looking for you know ways to achieve more freedom or even want to get into property sourcing right like i want us to you know tell i want you to tell them you know like share any advice or tip that you think is important for them for you know to make that transition in life like if they're trying to like leave a job or you know, basically just start a business, start a side hustle, whatever it is, really, just give um, us any advice that you think would help inspire more women to, you know, make that transition, like literally take the leap of faith and say, it's now or never, and I'm doing this right now. So give us an yeah. advice or tip or something that, you know, you feel like would be helpful for, for ladies in such positions. Yeah, I think it's just ultimately, I think it really comes down to, connecting with inside yourself and understanding exactly what's going to make you happy and what's going to motivate you to go forward try not to get um you know wrapped up in what other people are doing particularly things like social media you know it's so easy to see what everyone else is doing everyone only posts the good things on there you know no one's gonna go and this is what i say to everyone listen yeah i oh my god this is what i say to everyone because social media is such a facade like everyone just comes there and they post mm-hmm. what they want you to post and they go back home and they're crying and they're suffering and they're doing all this. Yeah. So, and then you're here judging your life based on someone else's highlights. You're judging your exactly. entire life based, on, based off of someone's highlights. So just forget so- social media, forget it. Like, yeah. do not ever compare yourself or judge your situation based on what you see on, on social media. Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent, and networking events as well. I could, I find that can be quite similar. You know, everyone's coming to those events with their best foot forward, and you know, I'm doing this. I've achieved this. This is what I'm doing. You know, they're, obviously they're going to put put forward all the best things because they're trying to impress everyone, just as you are as well. But you know, just try and remember, everyone's human. Everyone's going through struggles in the background as well, and um, and you know, try and just stay in your own lane and focus on what's what's right for you. Um, and once you really kind of tune into your own mind and your own heart, um, then you know things will work out. As long as you're connected with what with what you know is going to make you happy, then things have a way of kind of working themselves out. And um, that's what I believe anyway. That's right. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. That is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, so that brings us to the end of our episode today. Um, <laughs> Emily, thank you so much for sharing all your story, your journey. Thank you for all the tips and advice that you've given to us. I just have one question for you. Where would, where can people find you if they wanted to get in contact with you? Where can people reach you? If someone even wanted to utilize your certain, your sourcing services, where can they find you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, you can find me on all the social media channels um, under Properties for Potteries. So that's Properties with a number four, Potteries. Um, yeah, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and, and you can find my website and everything on there as well if, if you did want to get in touch. Okay, perfect. You know what? I almost forgot our firecracker questions. So what is the most adventurous thing that you've ever done outside of property? Oh, well, as I said, I used to be into music. I am still into music, but yeah, I used to be in a band. So I used to sing on stage okay. and all that stuff, which I don't think I'd do now. I think I'd be too nervous now. <laughs> I was very young then. <laughs> yeah, let's... Oh, that's nice. So we have a, yeah. an ex-musician <laughs> in the yeah. house. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, if you were to write a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, gosh. Um still figuring it out <laughs> still, figuring, still figuring it out yeah. that would be the title of the book that's good. Just... that's good because we're all still we're all still figuring it out that would be oh, actually a good title yeah um okay cool and um, so what is your guilty pleasure tv shows oh. um, movies just hanging out with friends having a glass of wine 
What exactly well, is it that you like to eat though, Jit? Yeah, what immediately jumped to mind was trash TV. Like, I love the Kardashians, anything like that. Yeah, it oh, is a girl that is me. That's <laughs> me. That's, that's, that's my beauty pleasure. That's the only thing I watch on yeah. TV, to be honest. Like, the Kardashians, <laughs> the real housewives of whatever. Oh, because yeah. I don't have the mindset or the time to sit down and focus on a movie or a TV show. I just yeah. want something that can play in the background while I carry on with my day. You know, yeah. doing my my business or whatever else that I need to do in the background. <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely I'm definitely all up there for for trash oh, TV. Yeah, another great one is uh, Below Deck as well. Have you watched that? Okay, no, I haven't seen that. It's is really it funny. It yeah, okay. yeah, it's about like uh, people who work on yachts, like fancy yachts, you know, charter oh. guests and stuff, and it follows like the crew. Yeah, it's it's really good. Yeah, interesting. And and I love selling sunset. Have you seen selling sunset? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's one of my favorites as well. Okay, if you could learn any skill or hobby right now, what would it be? Oh, that's another good one. I'd love to to be able to speak another language, which I definitely could learn if I put my mind to it. But I think what it's just that be. Um, I always liked French at school, so. I'll say French. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, so if you had a superpower, what would it be and how would you use it? Oh, that's another god, these are good questions. <laughs> superpower. Um probably to just like teleport anywhere I could, you know, in any just instantly snap my fingers and transport around because I'd save so much time. And I wouldn't be sitting in my car all the time and <laughs> sitting in traffic. Yeah. I could just... Mine, mine, mine would be to be telepathic, to just be a, a mind reader, able to read yeah. everyone's mind. That would be good. <laughs> That's what I would love to. You're just negotiating. So I to find the answers to everything and how to, how to be a bit on the end. I don't have to do all the work. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be getting the best deals out there. Exactly. I'll be getting the best deals out of life and everything that I want to do. But what's your childhood hobby? or interest that you wish you could pick back up now? Yeah, I, you know, I used to love horse riding. Um, yeah, my mum, bless her, she always used to take me to, to horse riding lessons, rain or shine, and she'd be sitting there freezing, you know, freezing cold watching me ride. Um, and it's a bloody expensive hobby as well. So I'm very grateful to my parents for letting me do that when I was younger. But yeah, I loved it. I loved horses. So do you, um, not, do you not horse ride anymore now? Or when no, have I haven't. Do? haven't in years no it's oh, um wow. again i don't know if i'd be brave enough now it's a lot it seems a lot further to fall <laughs> what's one piece of advice you wish you could give your younger self mm, that's another good question probably just relax like it's um you know i've always been someone who's like worked up and stressed and panicking you know overthinking things which I, I still do but I, I'm more conscious of it now and really try and just tell myself to just stop overthinking things take a deep breath, yeah. yeah take a deep breath and just take things as they come um so yeah that would probably be my advice to just just relax a little bit take some deep breaths as you said right <laughs> yeah that makes sense okay cool. so the very final question let's settle this debate once and for all <laughs> do you have pizza and pineapple mm. or pineapple on pizza no no pepperoni oh, really? all the way for me <laughs> well you're actually missing out because pineapple on pizza is the absolute best like there's no really? other way to eat pizza without pineapple on it you have oh. to try it you just have to try it <laughs> I everyone have says it. Every, every, have you tried it and you didn't like it uh, well i wouldn't say i didn't like it was okay but i wouldn't choose it from Domino's, you know <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? If I call Domino's to other pizza and they don't have pineapple and they say, Oh, we've run out of pineapple, I'm like, don't worry, just forget the pizza then. It's a little worth it. <laughs> it means that much. Wow. <laughs> it does, it does. That brings us to the end of our episode today. Thank you so much for coming on Fire Podcast and sharing your experience, sharing your knowledge, giving us your advice and tips. Thank you for everything. And it's been an amazing um, you know, opportunity and pleasure speaking to you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day so i wish you all the absolute best in 2024 with all your deals all your future plans and you know keep smashing it girl well uh, thank you so much thank you cynthia it's been such a great conversation thank you for having me on all right take care bye-bye <laughs> thank you take care <laughs>